Hello everybody, this is Speedy Master Dalton Preen, and I welcome you to this Chess Openings 101 intro to the Nimzo Indian Defense video course here today. Throughout this four-part video course, I'm going to be helping you to better understand the Nimzo Indian Defense opening, the main themes and plans for both white and black in the opening, how to play the opening yourself, how to play against it, as well as different tactical tricks and patterns that you're going to want to memorize if you're going to play this opening or if you're going to be playing against this opening uh, a good amount. Now the goal of this video course is for you to get better at this opening so that you can either play it yourself or so that you can know what to do against it if you happen to face it in your own games. The better you understand the opening, its different structures and plans, then the better your results will be when playing or play against this opening. Now the progression of material throughout the video course is going to be as follows. The first video is going to be a basic overview of the opening as well as a brief history of it. The second video is going to teach you how to play the opening yourself as black. The third video is going to teach you how to play the opening as white, and um, the fourth and final video is going to introduce some puzzles to solve that revolve around different patterns in this particular opening we're going to look at. So let's first of all see the basic opening moves that are played to reach the Nimzo Indian defense opening here. So the opening starts off with d4, knight f6, c4, e6, knight c3, and bishop to b4. Now this is the start of the Nimzo Indian defense opening here. This is a hypermodern opening that was developed by Aaron Nimzovich, who first used it in the early 1900s. Now, the idea for black here is by pinning white's knight with the move bishop to b4. Black is preventing white uh, from playing the intended move that he wanted to play, which was the move uh, pawn up to e4 on move number 4 here. Obviously, if white plays e4 right now, black will go ahead and just capture the pawn due to the pinned uh, knight here. Also, by pinning white's knight, black is looking to possibly inflict doubled pawns on white's position here. Black may intend to capture the knight, forcing white to recapture with the b-pawn, and then white would have doubled c-pawns on both the c3 and c4 squares if uh, that was to be allowed. Now, the main thing, though, for white here is that white was going to attempt to create a big pawn center with this opening still, still looking to make the move e4 at some point down the road, possibly. And white's also going to develop his pieces to prepare for an assault on the black position. Now, this opening, along with other Indian-style openings, such as the Queen's Indian Defense, which is characterized by the moves knight f3 and b6, different than this uh, knight c3, bishop e4, and it was an uh, Indian opening. But uh, this opening, along with other Indian-style openings, it's a very uh, flexible defense to the move uh, 1d4 in the opening. This can also uh, transpose into the Queen's Gambit opening. It can transpose into the Queen's Indian defense, as we saw a moment ago. If Black plays b6 a little bit later down the road. Um, so it's a, an opening that is highly respected. Uh, the Nimzo Indian open, uh, defense opening is highly respected defense to the move 1d4. And it's been played at all different levels and by numerous world champions throughout the history of chess. Now, as mentioned earlier, there are a little bit of similarities uh, between this Nimzo Indian defense and the Queen's Indian defense, which is with the move uh, b6 um, rather than bishop to b4 if white had played knight f3 instead. The connection between these two different openings all comes down to the battle for control over the e4 square that both white and black are going to engage in throughout the opening and middle game as the game progresses. If white is able to get in the move uh, e4 without any downsides, then white's usually going to be a bit better um, but on the other hand, if black is able to give white some kind of disadvantage in the process or completely prevent the e4 pawn advance, then black stands to have good chances as the game goes along. So a big battle in this opening already from the beginning is controlling e4. If white can play it, white will usually be pretty good, especially if nothing bad goes, uh, nothing bad happens in the meantime. And if, uh, if black can prevent e4 from happening, then black will usually be doing pretty good himself. So from this opening position, uh, we can already see a few advantages for each side of the board, even only about three moves into the game here. As tends to happen in most openings, white has gained a space advantage here. White does have the pawns up on c4 and d4, and black has no pawns on his own fifth rank here. So white controls a bit more space at this point. Um, however, black has a development lead. He does have a bishop and knight developed and is able to castle very quickly. On the other hand, white only has one knight developed and needs a couple of moves to get the bishop and knight moved so that he can castle kingside himself. So white has a space advantage, black has a development lead at this particular uh, point of the opening. And also, black really doesn't have any particular targets uh, for white to attack just yet. 
Now, right away, White needs to uh, contend or think about the potential idea of Black capturing the knight on c3, uh, which would give White double pawns, as we mentioned a little bit earlier. White needs to decide for himself whether this is something he is okay with allowing, or if he wants to prevent it. There are definitely situations where allowing the double pawns is not a big deal. Other times, you may prefer, personally, to not have double pawns, and we'll talk about how to um, play with or how uh, with double pawns or how to avoid double pawns as the video uh, course goes along. Additionally, Black is going to look to play moves such as uh, c5 or d5 or d6 and e5. Any one of these three advances, c5, d5, or e5 at some point, in order to harass White's two pawns on c4 and d4. If White's able to keep his center secure, then he'll maintain an advantage going through the middle game while Black is looking to harass that center. Again, just like the control of e4 earlier, the, ultimately another big main battle in this opening is going to be Black's pieces exerting pressure on White's center, while White aims to solidify his center and space advantage in the process. If Black is able to put enough pressure that he might be able to gain the advantage, um, then he, or then he might be able to gain the advantage on the, if he's putting enough pressure on the center. While if White's able to keep everything solid and safe, then he'll use his space advantage to have a better position, especially going into the middle game. So from this position now on move number four, White has a couple of different options here uh, of what he's going to do. Black has just made the pin with Bishop to b4, and now White has options here. White can play the move uh, Queen to c2. Uh, which is the line that I'm going to recommend and focus on throughout the video course. But there are also moves that work out, such as e3, knight f3, uh, and even a3 immediately harassing the bishop. These are other moves that work out in this position as well. Now, the reason I'm going to recommend queen to c2, uh, as, as we're going to see you know, as the video course progresses, uh, this is the main reason we're going to recommend queen c2 as a response for white here against the Nimzo Indian defense, is because it allows white to maintain a solid pawn structure. Because after queen to c2, white is going to be able to recapture on c3 with the queen, and white's not going to have to deal with double pawns. Um, and also white will be looking to use the bishop pair as the game goes on. Now there is a slight downside to queen c2 though. Um, the slight downside is that it is, it is continuing to delay the development of the king side. And the queen might have to move a second time, especially if black does take the knight and white takes back. The queen is moving a second time uh, early on in the game usually. Because of this, Black may work to quickly open up the center of the board and try to use his development lead to create an early attack against White's uh, king and against White's center especially. Once again, as long as White can hold off this attack on his center, uh, then um, we're going, uh, which we're going to talk a little bit more about in a future video in, uh, within this course, then White's going to be able to maintain the advantage of the bishop pair in extra space while Black is going to have trouble dealing with that. Now, let's go ahead and look at two examples briefly, just to show how this opening can be played for white and how it can be played for black. Our next two videos are going to go more in-depth on these ideas, so for now we're just going to have a bit of brief comments on these two games we're starting off with right now. So from this first game we're going to look at, it's going to be uh, essentially how black is able to play a good game, and he can win using his active pieces, opening up the center, and using his lead in development. Uh, which is definitely one of the uh, advantages he gets out of the opening here. So let's put this game example on the board, and we'll look at this one from Black's point of view. The next game we'll look at will be from White's point of view. So it starts off again with the main opening moves, d4 and knight f6, c4, e6, knight c3, bishop b4. White does go for that queen c2 move, and Black decides to play c5, immediately challenging the central d4 pawn, which White's queen is no longer protecting. So White took on c5. Black castle, bishop f4, knight a6, a3, there is the trade on c3, knight e4 harassing the queen, uh, black recaptures the pawn on c5, and immediately right now black has the threat of playing the move knight to b3, forking both the queen and the, oops, zero those arrows, uh, the queen and the rook that's on a1. White in the game played rook to d1, black played d5 looking to open up the center, and also protect his knight that's on the e4 square. White played b4, harassing the knight on c5. Black played knight a4, f3, knight c3 attacking the rook. You can already see kind of at this point that black's lead in development is pretty uh, pretty substantial. White has not moved any of his king side pieces here, and black is starting to uh, harass white at this point. Rook to d3 attacking the knight, f6 threatens the move e5, oops, which is going to fork the bishop and the queen. If, black, if white tries to take the knight on c3, black will first throw in the move e5. Queen will move away to keep the rook protected. Take, take. 
Black will take the bishop, and black is now up the exchange here. So capturing on c3 doesn't work just yet, so instead, white played bishop d2, retreating the bishop. e5 hit the queen, queen moved away, d4 protects the knight, and after the move e3, black played bishop f5, attacking the rook. The bishop took on c3, uh, the knight took back on c3. Taking the rook on uh, d3 is not as good here, because white can recapture and threaten some kingside attack at this point. So instead, black just decided to take back on c3 with the knight. White retreated the rook. And black actually ends up sacrificing his queen here with the move d takes e3. White does pick up the queen. Black takes back. But all of a sudden, black has very big threats here of moves such as rook to d1 checkmate. And the king, we can see it, this big lead of development black has is uh, very dangerous for white at this point. Bishop e2 protects the mate. Rook d2 gets the rook to an active square. g4, bishop d3. Again, if the bishop takes... Black will just play rook d1 mate. The king moved. Knight takes e2, knight takes e2, rook takes e2. Black now has a queen, or black has a rook and a bishop versus the queen. But white's rook on h1 is also not doing anything here. White played king g1, black played rook d8. Black is simply going to move the bishop away somewhere and then play rook to d1 mate. And there's not really a good way for white to stop this. So White ended up resigning in this position, and you can really see from this first game example, uh, the idea of Black using his active pieces, using his lead in development, if he's able to open up the center quickly before White's able to develop his own pieces on the king side, Black can definitely get a nice advantage here. Now, this isn't just to show that Black has always the advantage in this opening, though. Let's see a different game where White's going to win the game based on using his uh, space control, using his bishop pair, um, different things like that. So let's kind of put this uh, next game example on the board. And we're going to look at this one from White's point of view. So d4, knight f6, c4, e6, knight c3, bishop b4, same opening here. White does go for the queen c2 route. Black does again play this c5 move that we looked at in the previous game. White takes the pawn. Knight a6, a3, again we have the same trade on c3. Knight takes c5. In this particular case, white goes with the move f3 to prevent any of the knights from going to e4. D6, black is not opening up the center just yet. White does play E4 to get the nice solid center. E5, and now white goes to work on developing his pieces. Bishop E3, queen C7. White did have the threat of capturing the knight. Black takes back, and then the E5 pawn would be unprotected. So queen C7 protects the knight. Knight E2, bishop E6, queen C2, castle, knight C3. White is aiming for this nice D5 square. And also in the process, he is developing his king side compared to white in the previous game was not doing the same thing. a6, white plays rook c1, knight d7, queen d2, queen b8, knight d5, take, take, trade rooks, and white does get castled. We can already see at this point that white has pretty much uh, survived the opening phase. He has the bishop pair now, he has a big lead in space, he has the control of the c-file, well, which we'll kind of be battling for as the game goes on. And that's going to be some of the big things that are going to uh, become important factors in this uh, middle game going into the end game as well. Rook to c8, queen d2, queen c7, rook c1. Eventually we get into this end game where it's two bishops versus two knights. And white is going to use the bishops uh, to win the game essentially. Now it is kind of a closed position in the center, so you may think the knights are better than the bishops here. But white is going to look to advance, gain space, and eventually make a move that's going to open up the middle of the board a bit more. Bishop c1, king d8, bishop e2. King moves around a bit. Bishops are repositioning and white's gaining more space. And eventually white plays the move f4 looking to open up the center. f6 looks to protect it. Bishop f5 hits h7. Uh, white is just poking around for weaknesses here. A trade of pawns. King moves, threatening bishop takes h6. H5 was played, bishop e3, king d6, bishop h6, and then g4. White's looking to open up this uh, position even further. Trade of pawns, bishop retreats, king moves around a bit more. Black plays f5, there's a trade of pawns once again. And white is going to look to use his outside pass pawn on the h-file in order to uh, win the game, as we're going to see. He's going to kind of kick the knights around a bit, look to harass them. Eventually, he's going to get to this kind of position here. Black actually just ended up resigning here. White can pick up the uh, pawn on e4 at any point. He can always go back and pick up a6 if he wants. And black is uh, going to at least lose one pawn, and probably still white's going to win using his past h-pawn in the near future. 
So we can see here that if the longer the game goes on, especially with the bishop pair, especially if white's able to use them effectively in the middle game and end game, white's uh, usually going to have a nice advantage going into the more middle game part of the, uh, of the game. Black, though, does tend to have the advantage a little bit at the early portion of the game based on his lead and development, being able to open up the center and things like that. So we can really see from these two examples of the overall play that can arise from the opening, uh, we see that the battle lines are pretty clearly drawn here. Black's going to look to use that uh, lead in development and attack white center. White's going to try to keep it defended, and white's going to try to use the bishop pair as the uh, middle game uh, happens. So uh, an interesting fight always tends to ensue in, these in this kind of opening. If you enjoy openings with clear ideas and plans, with the possibility of interesting positions and tactical skirmishes, um, then this is definitely an opening for you. So I definitely recommend you uh, to check out the three other videos in this video course, study the positions, learn from our discussion, and apply the tips, tricks, and advice in your own games. And I'm sure you'll get a better understanding of this opening and be prepared to play with or against it in your future games. Now, in the next video, we're going to be going more in-depth on the possible plans for Black and how you can get strong play in a variety of positions. I'll see you in that next video, and I will talk with you uh, pretty soon again. Okay, talk to you later. Bye-bye.